Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to Human Sounds. Are you ready to receive and manage USAID funding webinar? I have a couple of quick slides to go through before I hand it to our speaker. First, a big thank you to our industry partners, all of whom you can see here, their support and expertise make Humentum's work possible and we're grateful. Next, I would like to remind everyone that we will continue to host webinars and support our members and their work. Here are a few of our upcoming events, including webinars and roundtables. I will share a link of the upcoming events and Humentum Connect in the chat. A few housekeeping notes. All attendees are currently muted. To ask questions, please feel free to type in the chat box. You can access the chat box by clicking on the chat bubble at the bottom of the screen. Questions will be kept until the end or unless the, the speaker uh, feels comfortable pulling it into the discussion. So feel free to engage with us throughout the session and we will do our best to address all your questions. Subtitles are available for this webinar to turn them on or off. Please click on caption or live, trans live transcription on your Zoom toolbar, then show or hide based on your preference. Uh, kindly do not change the speaking language uh, we will, uh, because it will affect the whole transcription of the webinar. And lastly, this webinar will be recorded and, uh, and a recording along with any additional materials will be emailed later this week. Check your spam folder if you do not receive it in your inbox. With that, I am very excited to introduce and hand over today's session to our speaker, Keith Edwards, who is a consultant and Humentum associate. Over to you, Keith. Thank you, Helen. Um, I just want to share my screen. Um, here we go. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon <clears throat> to everyone. Uh, as Helen said, I am a an associate consultant with Humentum, and I do these webinars, and I do um, USAID rules and regulations, procurement, subaward management, etc. So some of you might have been in uh, sessions, workshops that I have facilitated. Um, this is exciting for us because we are going to go into talking about when you are considering or preparing to receive USAID funding, what is involved? So we're gonna talk about some key parts of it. And we have a short time here. So I'm gonna try and go through as much as possible and then take the questions. If I see that there are some things that are really critical that will need to be addressed right away in the chat, then um, I might then break. So we'll see how it flows, okay? It's an informal session, uh, so um, we are going to ask you for some feedback twice um, when we do some polls, uh, but it's mostly about a discussion about preparedness and readiness to receive USAID funding, including how readiness can be a foundation for your organization's growth, uh, for your organization's compliance standards uh, for your USAID programs. We will look at what resources are available for you to reduce some of the risk that might be there when you're looking to receive USAID funding or considering going after it. There are always the risk with working with donors, receiving funding from donors, and you then have to be prepared for how you're going to be addressing how, first, how you identify what those risks are and what resources are available to uh, address them. And we will then look at what opportunities there are in this whole process to grow your business, to bring in that USAID funding, to look at other funding agencies in the US government that you might then be considering. And then we will wrap up with a discussion about how readiness equals your resources and it can lead to opportunity and growth for your organization. So let's start with the first part about the readiness being the foundation. So I wanna ask, we wanna get some information from you about 
your view of what readiness means so that we can use that as part of the foundation for our discussion here. And we're going to do a quick poll to get your, um, your view of what this means. So if you can uh, select the answer to this, these questions that we have here, what does readiness mean? Is it for you knowledge of the regulations? Is it having operating policies and procedures? Or do you consider readiness as having well-trained staff? And the last one, expertise on the applicability of the regulation. Which of these would you consider to be your view of readiness? Let's get some more responses. We'll do this for about 30 seconds more. Hi, Henrik. We'll give it just a couple more seconds, about 10 more seconds. We can end it here. And so the two highest responses that we had, and we'll send these responses to you, were the majority of you said having operating policies and procedures is what you consider as the first criteria for being ready. And the second one was expert expertise on the applicability of the regulations. The other two, knowledge of the regulations and well-trained staff seemed about equal. Okay. The reality though, oh, let me get back to sharing here. The reality is that all of this is a part of your organizations saying that you're ready to be able to receive USAID funding, any, any government funding. And the reason for that is because you have to know what the regulations are. Your staff have to have knowledge of it. You have to have the operating procedures in place to be able to, to, to deal with them. And you have to look at what it is that is going to help build your organization's ability to be able to receive the funding, be in compliance with the requirements. So think of it as a trip. You're getting ready for this trip. And you need to do, you have, you need to have certain things in place. You need to have a visa. So you would want to, if it's a group of you that's going, somebody is, get, is going to need to know what the requirements are for this visa. Somebody is going to have to go and get the visa. You're going to have to have the resources to be able to apply for the visa, to buy your, your tickets, to uh, allow for your accommodation, your spending, your meals, et cetera. All of that has to be funded. When you get on the trip, you have to know where you're going, what the destination is going to be, where you, what you intend to do during that trip and what the final outcome is going to be. That's part of the relationship that you're going to be creating with USAID. You need to know what the requirements are, prepare for it and have people on your team who know what those requirements are and can lead the process to a successful conclusion. So readiness is building that foundation for you to be able to say, we have what is in place to be able to receive the funding and carry out a successful program. It starts when you consider, when you make that decision, should we go after this funding or not? Because then you're looking at what is going to be the requirements for us to be able to 
implement that program to receive the funds and show that we will be in compliance with that the, the funding. So you need to know what do we need this funding for? Is it to grow a current program? Or is it because your organization is going into a new area? So you determine internally what is going to be the priority that is going to lead this drive to uh, get the funding. You're going to be looking at if it's to fund a program or priority, what are the program activities that are related to that? And what is the capacity building that might be needed for you to be able to show that you have a solid foundation to be able to implement this program? So in order to be able to know what goes into this foundation, you have to do an assessment. And that assessment is going to include certain things. First, what is the level of knowledge that you have in your organization of this funding agency that you're getting the, the you're planning to get the resources is resources from. When the knowledge exists, you want to know how deep is that knowledge? Is it superficial? Do you just know? I, I know some things about what they need for procurement. I know what the program responsibilities are. How deep is that knowledge? Is it at the point where you can say we are really invested in this and we know exactly what is required. If so, you can then say we can go ahead with this. But if there are gaps, you then need to address those gaps and not every organization is going to have every single um, aspect of implementing a program in place. Where there is a gap, you have to find a way to then fill that gap either through hiring staff, bringing in the resources, bringing in consultants, training your staff. So you're looking at how we provide the whole picture in terms of the knowledge. The organization itself, you have to look at how stable it is. If you're looking for funding because you have a funding shortfall, you are going to have to remember that with US government funding, you still have to have resources of your own. There is this view that the US government provides you with all of the resources to implement a program. And that's mostly true. But there are other aspects that you then have to um, fund from on your own. One of them that you will have to look at is some programs require cost share, a cost share commitment, where the federal government is providing the majority, but your program then provides a certain amount. And when you offer that amount and it's volunteered because you decide how much you're going to provide, when you provide it and it, it's accepted and it's in your award document, it then becomes a legal requirement where if you don't provide that, you are not in compliance with the award requirements that they have, provide, have given to you. When the program is over, you also have some financial commitments because you have uh, documents that you will have to retain for a certain period of time. The cost of retaining those documents after the program is over is your responsibility. If you're working with subrecipients, other organizations, you then have to um, take their documents or you have to have them retain those documents and there's a cost there also. And somebody has to cover that cost and it is not going to be the federal government because the funding will only go up to the end of that, pro that program. Your systems, you're going to be looking at what is already there, and based on the regulations, do you need to make adjustments to your systems or do you need to create new systems? The ideal is that you already have something in place that qualifies you to be able to, uh, to receive the funds. And you then just have to make adjustments. If it is something that you need to create from scratch, it is possible to still get the award. They will then give you special conditions, specific conditions where they will say, we will give you this award, but you then need to put these things in place. Sometimes the cost of that can be built into the program. Sometimes you have to find your own resources to be able to then uh, implement those or build those, those systems. 
The assessment is going to look at what the risks are of carrying out this program. Sometimes you have to work in environments that are political risk, geographic risk, environmental risk. You, those are the external parts. You also have to look internally. When the compliance uh, needs are assessed, do you have the ability to be able to meet those compliance requirements? Do you have, does your staff have the knowledge? Do you have the systems in place to be able to meet them? If you don't, you then have to, uh, you have to put in place corrective actions to make sure that you're addressing those uh, risks that might uh, exist at the moment or might come out of the program. And then you're looking at the authorities that are involved, the local authorities, you're looking at the regulatory authorities, you're looking at your organization's own requirements, your management has requirements that they are putting in place that for every program you have to comply with, and you then have to look at what is the, uh, there might be conflicts between what management wants, what the organization is set up to, to do, and what the regulatory requirements are are going to be asking you to uh, comply with. When there are conflicts, you have to look at which is the one that comes first. If you're implementing a program in a certain country, let's say for this, we use the example of Tanzania, you have to, your obligation is to first comply with the requirements in Tanzania. Your next responsibility is to comply with what is in your award document itself, because that award document is what you signed and you said, when we receive this award, we receive the funding, we agree that we will comply with these requirements. The regulatory requirements come next because the schedule, your award document will tell you which regulations apply. Whatever is in that award, that is what you're going to be looking at first before you look at the regulations. And then your organization's operating procedures come down there after all of these things, okay? So in terms of the issues in readiness, our second um, poll that we want to get your, your input on here is what would you consider as the biggest cost of being unprepared? Because I've talked about some of the things that need to be in place. What do you think is the biggest cost of if you're not prepared, if you don't have those things in place, that it will be to your organization. Is it higher program cost, a longer program implementation time, or donor disappointment that you didn't comply with requirements that they, you didn't meet the expectations that they were expecting from you when they gave you this award? So let's uh, get your input here and we will see what your experiences and then come back to discuss it. Hmm. interesting what uh the responses are and i'll uh, we'll talk about what the the outcome is in um, just a little while when we give you a bit more time to respond we'll do this for about 25 more seconds And let's end here, uh, Helen. Okay, and let me go back to share. Okay, so interestingly, the majority of you said donor disappointment is the biggest cost. 
And that was followed by higher program costs. And at the bottom was longer program implementation time. Let's look at each of those. So the one that you, you said is the, is the biggest one, donor disappointment. The donor expects that when you are accepting the, the award, that you will have systems in place to be able to implement that program. And it doesn't have to be exactly what what their regulations say, because in the regulations, in the cost principles, there is a part that talks about your responsibility for implementing the program. And it says there that because of the unique nature of your organization, you're expected to have operating systems that meet your requirements to best implement the program according to your views, your needs because of the unique nature of your organization, the unique component of your staff, et cetera. And that's also because of the type of program that you're implementing. That gives you the authority to say, for example, in procurement, that you are going to implement program in a way that meets your organization's requirements, but which is still in compliance with the donor's requirements. If you don't have that system in place, the donor is going to be disappointed, but the donor is going to expect that you are going to do something about it, that you are going to be given the opportunity to fix that problem. If you don't fix it, then they will take uh, stronger steps. They might suspend your program, or if, and if you don't do anything after the program is suspended, then it will lead to, to termination of your program. And that's where your organization is then going to face a hurdle in the future for getting additional funding or new funding from that funding agency and from others, because donors share information among themselves about your performance. So the disappointment part is there, but is it really the biggest component, the biggest cost? When you have issues where you have to go back in and you have to fix them, that is going to lead to putting time into addressing something that should have been there when you were preparing to receive the award. And that time that you're now taking to fix that problem, you're taking it away from program implementation. So, because you know you only have certain amount of resources, time, staff, et cetera. You have to move people from one place to another to address this. And that's going to lead to pro longer program implementation time. The longer you take to implement a program is the bigger the cost is going to be. So we have two of these that are related. In fact, all of them are related. But longer program time is going to lead to higher program cost. And you only have a finite amount of resources that's available. So preparing for this program means that you're preparing for on-time program implementation at the cost that you budgeted for so that the donor is satisfied with your performance and that you are not disappointing them and you're not disappointing yourself or affecting your organization's reputation for being on time, for carrying out quality work, for doing what you said, what you promised you said you would do when you provided that proposal. So for each of them, I would agree that longer program implementation time is high, a high cost. The donor disappointment is there, but I, in my view, I would put it second to the longer program implementation time and the risk that you are then running of high program costs that you might then have to cover because you didn't look at what was necessary for you to be ready for this program. So in doing this assessments, some of the things that we have seen uh, from historical information Lack of knowledge of USAID's resources uh, requirements is one of the biggest thing that's, things that comes out in these assessments and outdated systems. You have a system in place, but it doesn't meet the current requirements of the donor. And sometimes it doesn't meet your own requirements because unfortunately organizations put together uh, systems and they're comfortable with those systems, but then they don't look at the growth of the organization or the change in the changes in the industry, 
They look, don't look at the change in uh, the changes that are required to address the growth of the organization. They don't look at how you, they can use resources to help address those required changes and reduce the risk that they have in implementing their program. So let's look at some of those things about the resources that might be avail available to you. When you do the assessment, you now have knowledge of where the gaps are, where your strengths are, what the donor's requirements are. With that knowledge comes responsibility, that now you know what is required, you have to do something about it. You have to address the systems, the uh, the requirements of the, of the donor, you have to address the program implementation requirements that you might have. You use the assessment to address those challenges, to manage what you are going to, the steps that you will take to address them. So you look at strengthening your policies and procedures and building the systems. And remember, this can be a part of the program proposal that you're putting in. You can look at, we are going into a new area where we need to have additional resources to strengthen the organization or to address a new component that this donor is asking us to, to deal with. And you include that in there. Remember, there's going to be a limit on how much you're going to be including because they're going to look for the strongest organization that can implement the program at the best cost. And if there's going to be additional costs that you are bringing in to build your own system, then they might question, why aren't you doing that yourself or preparing yourself at your own cost before you, uh, you look for this, this uh, funding? In Building systems, you are enhancing the, the ability of the organization to be in compliance with the, organ, the donor's requirements as well as your own requirements. Because the stronger the system is a better possibility that you have of a successful program in on the operations side and the program implementation side. One of the ways that you can do that is expanding the staff knowledge as you're building the system. So you look at what resources are available to help build the system and expand the staff knowledge of the organization. One of the ways that you can do that is by looking at the uh, resources that are available from the community. And one of them is USAID's Readiness Consultancy Services that's provided by Humentum itself. And we'll talk some more about that resource that is available to you. But next, let's look at the opportunity to grow the business because you want to know what is, re what is required for you to be able to ready to, to be ready to exceed to receive USAID's funding. So what is expected of you when you are going after this funding? that you know what the requirements are, you know what the regulations are, and you have the systems in place to be able to address them. And those systems are going to be reflected in your operating policies and procedures. So in one of the regulations, it talks about internal controls, that you have to have the procedures and the policies in place, but it also says that you have to assess them to be able to see that they are, uh, that they are reflecting what the donor's requirements are and what your requirements are. That's doing an assessment, that's doing an evaluation of your organization's operating policies and procedures. So remember the slide before where we said that you might have the systems in place, but they are outdated. This is what you sometimes discover when you look at what do my systems say? What do they reflect? If they were created 10 years ago and nobody ever looked at them to see, did you update them when the regulations changed? Did you update them when the funding environment changed? You don't have what is going to be necessary to grow the organization or to show that the organization can guarantee full compliance with the requirements. USAID is expecting full compliance, not partial, so whatever you have there has to then be reflecting your ability to say, we are not going to have compliance issues. Now, is it realistic to say that you will never have non-compliance? No, it's not. And you know, the Office of the Inspector General, which does reviews and audits of organizations, they sometimes say that if an organization never had 
a problem, never had a um, an incident where there has been fraud or improper use of funds, then they consider that organization as a red flag, not as an organization that is green and you can you know not look at them because you are working with humans, you're working with systems, and there will be issues that need to be addressed. So this is about the accountability. When we look at the people who are implementing the program, are you holding them accountable? Do your systems, the internal controls, the systems, the policies, the procedures, do that? Do they allow for accountability? When a mistake is made, how soon is that mistake corrected? How do you find that, that mistake? So your system has to be able to catch those things. Not every organization is going to be, you know, saying that, oh, we're going to be studiously looking for fraud in the program. You have to trust your staff. You have to trust the processes that you put in place to protect the staff and protect the organization and protect the donor. But it has to be such that it is able to then allow for accountability, allow for reporting, allow for corrective actions to be taken and resulting in cost effectiveness because the focus has to be on implementing the program and not cons constantly going back to fix problems because you were not ready or you didn't, you didn't put the systems in place to reflect them. So in addressing your policies and procedures to see, do they allow for my readiness? Some things that you'll be looking at is when, were the, when was the last time you reviewed those documents, those policies and procedures for content? The content in there, is it understandable? Is it readily available? When was the last time you trained your staff on the programs and the, the policies and, 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 and procedures? In assessing the usefulness of those items, how did you do that? Did you ask users for the information and incorporated their responses into rebuilding, revising, updating your systems? Do they incorporate all of the USAID's requirements? How do you know what USAID's requirements are and that they have been incorporated into that document? When did you provide staff an opportunity to be able to go to a rules and regs workshop, for example, or a procurement workshop to be able to obtain the knowledge and bring it back into the organization and address the functions that they are working in? And when there are conflicts between the regulations, between your organization's requirements, between with your board requirement, board standards, how do you address those issues? So Resources, having resources in place reduces risk. And the resources that we are talking about is primarily the knowledge and the ability to be able to apply that knowledge to your operating policies and procedures, your systems. Some of the ways that you can do that, workshops, and some workshops that are available through Humentum, USAID's Rules and Regulations workshop that provides a, a basic intro to these are the standards, the key principles that the US government expects you to address in your policies and procedures and provides you with an opportunity to apply them in scenarios, in discussions. Contracts management, uh, there is a difference between your assistance awards and your contracts. Your contracts requires that you have to have uh, additional systems in place and a different set of operating standards than for your assistance awards. Procurement planning and sub-award management, two key parts of implementing your program that you want to make sure you have operating standards to address those. And the um, building, using all of the knowledge obtained in these types of workshops to build the systems and the knowledge of your organization to be ready to receive uh, U.S. government funding. So the last part of this, readiness, resources, leading to opportunity. So here's how it will work. And I'll use this to an example with time reports. One of the things that many of us don't like doing, 
And uh, in looking at the history, we see that organizations that are considering going after USAID funding, time reporting becomes a big surprise to them. So you, the organization approaches us and says, we want to go after this USAID assistance award. Um, and we say to them, well, one of the things that you need to have in place is a time reporting standard. And that time reporting standard needs to have a system for when staff do their time reports, what they put on the time reports, how they allocate their time, their real time and not the budgeted time, who signs off on those awards, um, those uh, time reports, and then how, you, how do you use that to charge your salaries, to support the salaries that you are charging to an award. And that becomes a surprise because they might have been used to, well, staff are working and we know that they're working and they come in every day and we don't need them to fill out a time report that says they spent five hours on this project and two hours on this project. They just get paid their salary that is budgeted. And when we show them that that is not what the US government requires, they require a much more detailed system, there is panic because they, re they know that there is going to be a risk because they don't have the policies and procedures in place. And they have to deal with the issue of the culture, which says, we don't do that unnecessary bureaucratic process. We get paid because we provide what the donor wants us to provide. So getting organizations to implement time reporting standards becomes a really difficult process. And one of the biggest part of that, the, the hurdle in that is changing the culture of the organization to say that we are going to account for the time that we are in the office and that we are working. When they actually do it, because in order for you to receive US government funding, you have to do it. It is one of the mandatory requirements that you have to have in place. Once they do it, what they find is that it now satisfies the donor's requirements. It satisfies the auditor requirements because the audit, auditor can look at how you met that requirement and it shows the auditors how staff are spending their time. It allows the organization to then look at the true cost of operating their business, the true cost of that particular project, and supporting the time allocations across the organization. Some organizations have then been able to move staff around to better manage their operating procedure, uh, their operations to carry out their programs. They are then able to show donors, here is how many staff would be needed for a particular project and the true salary cost um, based on the documented evidence that we have collected through those time reports. So the initial resistance to implementing time reporting standards then it goes away and it becomes embraced by those organizations because of the value that they have seen in doing it and the fact that they have met an, a donor's requirements that they thought was original, originally fairly difficult to do because that was not something that they had been doing for the previous 30 years, and now they have started doing it. So that readiness process where you might think that it is a, a burden, um, it can sometimes be a real benefit to the organization. When you look at the process of, this is not just about putting in place something that is unnecessary. It is required and you build it into the other operations of the organization um, so that it not, it's not just addressing one particular organ, um, donor. So some recommendations for how you address this readiness issue um, and you prepare the organization for successfully uh, implementing the awards that you're going to be going after. Focus on, the, the, um, on, on providing trainings, um, doing the assessments, determining where your gaps are, determining what the knowledge standard is and how deep or how light it might be and focus on 
what is the unique nature of your organization? Because it is not just about addressing what the donor regulations say, that you need to have a procurement standard or you need to have a sub-award management standard. You need to have those, but how does it work for your organization? So the regulations provides you with, here's what the donor is requiring. How is this going to work for my organization? Because after that donor is gone, you're going to continue implementing your program. And you don't want to implement something that is going to be just for the lifespan of that donor's particular program. You want it to be something that has really built the organization and is going to continue after that donor is gone. Okay, so focus on that unique part of your organization. Use the process to empower your staff to build standards that is going to suit the programs, the type of organization that you are, and build the capacity of the organization to continue this process going forward. When you're working with other organizations, sub-recipient organizations, for example, you're bringing them into this partnership because you need their expertise to help you carry out this successful program. Bringing them in, the, the fact that you're bringing in their resources to this program, you're combining their resources and your organization's resources, exchange ideas, exchange knowledge. Sub-recipients, are not your, um, you know, they're not there just so that you can have them do, take this and do it and then let us know that you have successfully done it. It's a partnership. And that partnership can lead to that organization becoming a much stronger organization that is going to enhance your ability to be able to carry out larger programs uh, in the future. Practice applicability of the of the regulations on the organization's operating circumstances. When you send your staff to a, a workshop, let's say on sub-award management, make sure that it's not just about learning the regulations about sub-award management, but that you are they are coming back to your organization with the ability to be able to practically uh, apply that knowledge. Because it's one thing to know what is on paper, but being able to use it in real life circumstances means that it's going to stick. If it is something that they're just, uh, you know, going and listening to a lecture, um, it is not going to be as uh, as beneficial as if they were practicing what they were doing. So come back to the organization and have them go into the operating procedures for sub-award management. Look at how does this then affect our current systems? Is there something that we need to change? And you do it right away. You know, the one of the things that happens is someone is might be away from the office for a couple of days doing a training and they come back to the office and they are faced with a burden of uh, things that they have to now catch up on and the training then gets lost. Um, have it be applied right away and build a culture of organizational compliance. It's not just about we are building this because we want to get more resources, more funding into the organization. It's also about knowing what the donors want and you are uh, ensuring that you're complying with those requirements, that you're showing the donor that we take seriously your requirements that say that we have to be accountable, that we have to be compliant with these requirements and we can show you how we have done that. And it is not something that is a burden, but it's something that is a, a part of the culture of the organization. Other things for long-term results. There are open courses for individuals and those focus on expanding the individual's knowledge that they then take back to the organization and implement in, in the organization's operating systems. That the individuals that attend these workshops, they build on establishing regulations. Um, a, a, I'm sorry, regu uh, build on establishing a foundation for that that individual's knowledge that they then apply to the organization. Those individuals become your compliance champions. They build their knowledge on certain things that they are 
um, implementing in your organization. The finance manager is going to focus on the financial requirements of the donor. The practi practical aspects of implementing those regulations in his financial, his or her financial um, work. That person is going to be the champion for this is why we need to do this because this is what the regulations say that we need to do. With the individuals who are attending those workshops is an opportunity to engage with others at other organizations and see what those other organizations are doing, bring back that expertise to you and implement it in your organization. It also creates links with people outside of your organization that when they are facing challenges, who can they call to say to, you know, how did you address this situation? Have you ever encountered it? Or what if you were in this situation, how would you deal with it? And so we are building a larger community of compliance uh, individuals who are helping each other address the challenges that they encounter. A main tool that Humentum has recently developed and they use is called the, the consultancy services um, tool. And here is how it works. Organizations are at different levels or they might have different requirements for how they are going to look for getting ready to receive US government funding. So at level one, you have an organization that is new to USAID funding. And the tool, the consultancy services that they provide is going to look at before you receive US government funding, what do you have in place? Doing that assessment. So it's looking at your current systems and how ready they are and where the gaps are for um, what, where you need to bring them up to the level that will be acceptable for when you submit your proposal and budget. So it's a, identifying the things that might need attention. Level two, is organizations that are already working with USAID and it's assessing what do you have in place and have they met your standards? So when you did the audit and the auditors had findings, why was that the case? Where were the gaps in your organization? So doing that assessment, reviewing your current operating processes and systems and identifying where you might need to strengthen those. So developing additional tools, providing additional resources to the staff, um, providing additional access to your operating systems and procedures. And then level three is doing a really in-depth examination of your organization to the point where you're preparing for audits, your, not just your regulatory or your mandatory audit, but a uh, a U.S. government audit, um, an end of program audit. It is testing compliance. Um, your systems that are in place, were you in compliance with those requirements and addressing non-compliance issues, uh, helping organizations address the um, uh, non-compliance and building corrective actions. So that is in uh, you know a short view of how you can be ready for your US government um, funding activities. And I'm gonna try and see the questions that you might have posed in here and answer some of those as quickly as I can. Um, Rama asked, I wanna ask if the record, recorded meeting will be sent to us via email. Uh, yes, thank you, Helen, for responding that it will be sent out. Um, let me go down here. Respond here. Um, I believe, Colin says, I believe you can be unprepared and still succeed, but financial costs would hit you the hardest. Colin, thanks for that comment. Now, you can be unprepared and still receive US government funding because the regulations allows agreement officers to do an assessment of your organization and where they find that there are risk issues or they might find that there are gaps in your operating policies and procedures, they will still give you an award 
but they will have specific conditions in that award. And those specific conditions will tell you what the issue is, the risk is that they have identified. They will give you an opportunity for addressing that risk issue. Will, they will tell you, here's what we expect you to do to address this. And they will say, here's the time within which you have to address this issue. So it's not going to be forever. You have to address it within a certain amount of time. Once you have successfully addressed it, that specific condition will then be removed from your award and you won't be held to this additional standard anymore. But there is a cost to it because for every action that you have in your program, you have somebody who is working on that. You have time, you have other resources that might need to be used to address that problem. So there is going to be additional cost. And sometimes that additional cost is covered in your award, sometimes it is not. You know, there is an organization that didn't have a process for managing the advances that they were receiving. And they were then required to put in place to have a consultant come in and address that issue, to write operating standards, to test them, and ensure that they were working. The organization had to do this at their own cost, and they had to do it within the first month that they had received the award. Um, can you give us the presentation of the program in the end? Yes. Okay. And that was addressed. The trust of your staff. What about the projects that the opening still under studying and they don't open yet? Like I didn't meet my staff yet and still working on attracting a qualified team. I I don't want to say it's a, a risk. There are, there are um, challenges that you will have in that kind of situation where you're starting a new program it's a brand new team. It's like systems, software that you might be implementing. It takes a while to get to know that system. So it will take a while for you to get to know that, that staff. And every donor, every auditor will say in the time that it takes for you to, to gel, to get to know each other and work well together, you have major risk and you have additional things that you will need to be looking at. You will need to be checking each other. So the risk there is going to exist. Working with a new donor is a risk because you don't know how that donor works. You don't know how the donor staff will interact with you. You don't know how they will you know, be forceful or in, in requiring you to comply with requirements or they might be less forceful. Um, you have to assess what that risk is and you have to look at what the organization's appetite for risk is going to be. Um, some management are very risk averse and they will say, we will take this one step at a, at a time. We will do one small project and then we will go on to a larger project or we will be a sub-recipient to another um, prime recipient of US government funding. And we will then see how that works. And that's then, and if that works successfully, then we will go into the um, looking at getting direct funding for ourselves. Um, what are the other ways to partner with USAID? It's probably, there are assistance awards um, where you have cooperative agreements and grants, uh, you, or you might have fixed amount awards. You can have acquisition awards where you have contracts. There is a difference. You don't call everything a contract because a contract is an acquisition mechanism. Contracts have much more stringent requirements and much more risk of working with the US government. If you're going to go after contracts, the advice is get someone to look at your systems um, because your assistance systems right now might meet the cooperative agreement or the grant requirement. The contracts is where you sometimes have to look at the additional requirements might not be a part of your organization or the risk issues that you will encounter that you are not prepared for what those risks are. So for example, if there is non-compliance under a contract, an acquisition award, 
you will have penalties and fines that you will in under assistance awards, you might then just have to pay back the uh, questioned or unallowed costs with interest. Okay, so those differences you would need to determine. Other ways of working with USAID is you can, sometimes USAID asks for help in determining what the, um, the, the situation for a certain um, priority program might be in, in a country. So they bring in organizations to help do assessments uh, or to write background uh, documents for that country situation. Um, so on USAID, on biz.gov, um, there are, you can see opportunities there. And on USAID's actual website, usaid.gov, uh, there are business sections that you can go in and see what they are looking for um, in terms of um, assistance from the community. Um, Account, um, Gilbert says that nice to hear that having registered and addressed an accountability issue doesn't blacklist you yet reporting yourself clean depicts you as a liar since humanly every organization has issues. Um, so, you know, Gilbert, this was at a, a conference um, in Washington where the Office of the Inspector General um, representative was saying that, you know, we think that those organizations that have never had somebody report, um, you know, issues of, um, uh, uh, of improper procurement, for example, that there's something wrong with that organization. It's not perfect. And there was pushback that there are organizations that are doing their best to manage their, their programs in the right way. And they don't have those issues, but maybe this was from their perspective that they saw it as there are always issues at these or at, at at organizations. And sometimes when we think about subrecipients, think about how those of you who might be working with subrecipients, think about how you deal with them, where you are always suspicious about them and you incorporate that into the way that you, you relate with them and the subaward document that you provide to them. Um, the suspicion part of it does cause issues with how people work together. Um, because you don't want to enter a relationship with suspicion as the primary part of it. Uh, so you have to look at how are we going to work with this organization? What are we putting in place to protect us and to protect them? Because they also are part of this and need to be protected and see the best way that you can work together. Um, when you're working with the donor, you show the donor, here is how we have operated, and you be confident about what you're presenting to them. If they are saying that there are risk issues that they might be concerned about them, about working with you, then put it in the award document and have you review that and see whether it's acceptable to you or not. Um, Rama, I think I answered your question above. Does USAID recognize the nonprofit status of an organization that complies with its country law or must comply with the US law for nonprofit? So in certifying whether what kind of organization you are, you're going to show what you're registered for in the particular country where you are operating. There are, there's, there are two categories, US organizations, non-US organizations. US organizations are registered with its headquarters in the U.S. and their responsibility, their legal responsibility is to U.S. to U.S. Uh, regulatory bodies. When they have offices outside of the U.S., those offices are part of a U.S. organization. The non-U.S. organizations are those that are headquartered outside of the U.S. and their regula regulatory bodies are outside of the U.S. Okay. Um, I'll answer one more because we are running out of time. The rest of the questions on here, we will note them and I will write um, short responses to them. And when we send you the follow-up email, we will provide the answers to this. Um, I'm also going to provide you with a checklist 
that helps with readiness that I wasn't able to show you here. Um, why does USAID use complicated portals and requirements? For example, SAM, which are even inoperable, focusing more on form than substance. Gilbert, it's one of the head headaches that all of us in the community have. Um, the systems that they put in place are meant to protect them. Uh, and we find that sometimes they don't work because they are not tested or they are too complicated for what they were intended to do. Um, I had to get uh, a SAM, uh, uh, an EIN number for an organization through SAM.gov, and it took weeks for us to be able to figure out how to work the system to be able to get it done. And we were very happy when it was successful, but it shouldn't have taken that long. Hopefully, the future is going to be better, and we will have USAID is going through a reform process now, and we are hoping that that will lead to better systems removal of some of the unnecessary um, regulations and some of the unnecessary requirements, um, but we will see. Okay. Thank you very much for having been here, for joining us today. And as I said, the rest of the questions that I haven't gotten to, we will provide you with responses to those in the follow-up email. Um, I wish I could have answered more of them face-to-face -face or have a direct discussion with you. But time is of um, is short for all of us. And so again, thank you very much. Uh, Helen and Victoria will have some parting words for you to tell you what will happen next as follow up. And um, I hopefully will see you in a workshop in the future or in a webinar in the future. Take care, everyone, and be safe. Helen, Victoria. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, as we said, we will share. Uh, we will share the recording in the follow-up email along with the resources that uh, Keith has mentioned. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, you will get that in the next, uh, within 48 hours. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I do not think uh, there's anything else on our end. So have a wonderful day um, or night from wherever you're joining us from and see you next time. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye.